shared screen. In fact, I need to figure out by the time I'm ready to keep you in the waiting room. I know how to do that in WebEx, but I don't know. I'll figure it out in the Zoom. That's, that's fine. Uh, Everyone can see my screen? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, taking out your uh, time from your busy schedule. I am sure that everybody is having their hands full uh, during this last few weeks of uh, this semester. And uh, today I'll be presenting my PhD uh, work that I have been doing for the past three and a half years at UTEP. And the title of my uh, Defend, I mean, PhD work is Effective Dopants on the Properties and Performance of Gallium Oxide as Bulk Ceramics and Nanomaterials. And today I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the metal oxides in general, then a little uh, about literature review and how we decided to work on this particular uh, project. And from there, with, uh, what were the uh, ideas and what were the plans that we decided to uh, pursue in this project and how uh, I was able to implement this uh, PhD work in fa different phases basically. And uh, then a few research output and future work uh, that I'll be, I mean, that is currently going on, but uh, how things uh, evolved during this entire journey of my PhD. So uh, a little bit about my background, Dr. Ramana gave a hearty introduction, but I just wanted to still uh, uh, talk a little bit uh, in depth. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm from a small town in, uh, in India and I did my bachelor's in engineering, uh, uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, and after that, I worked in industry for a few years in a power plant. And from there, I decided to go back to school and I joined uh, University of Akron at Ohio uh, for my master's degree, where I was working on the electrodiological fluids to make smart uh, materials uh, for smart tires. From there, I, I like uh, doing research. So I decided to continue my uh, work uh, in research and I joined University of California at Merced. And there I was uh, studying nanocontacts uh, of uh, gold and HOPG and how they evolve uh, with the uh, with electrical, mechanical and temperature stimuli and how they uh, behave individually and in, in to, I mean, uh, all in conjunction as well. From there, I life happened and I couldn't finish my PhD at UC. So I transferred out uh, after a small break uh, to UTEP. And currently I'm working on gallium oxide uh, bulk, bulk material and thin films as well. During this time, I was also uh, awarded with NSF intern fellowship. That was like, of course, Dr. Ramana helped me out with the application process and it is competitive and it just started in 2017. So it is, uh, I was like probably one of the, first 200 students that were awarded this fellowship. And I was, I am right, right now at Sandia National Labs and I'm using their uh, user facility that is Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies. And I'm uh, trying to hone my skills in TEM and also trying to help our team at UTEP with a little bit of uh, TEM expertise. Uh, during this uh, entire journey of my PhD, I was uh, able to publish uh, quite a few articles and Four of the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, journal publications were selected for cover pages, and I was able to contribute to these cover pages. I mean, that is that is one thing I liked about my uh, PhD journey. And also, we were also featured as as a lab. Uh, we were also featured uh, on the NSF website. Uh, that is, I mean, the works that uh, the work that is gallium oxide, uh, I mean, metal oxide works work that we are undertaking. So it uh, caught the attention of NSF as well. So this was a good thing. I mean, this, this came out of this work as well. Uh, this is a list of publications that I was able to accomplish this uh, in this PhD work. And uh, yeah, so that's a little bit in short how things evolved around uh, this PhD. And uh, let's get into the introduction of my di uh, dissertation. So uh, basically metal oxides have been uh, the backbone or the uh, jumping platform for many of our technological applications. So if you can see that uh, the photodiodes, are, uh, the photodiodes that is on the photo detector. So this is uh, a CD-ROM that, uh, that uses these photodiodes for reading and writing, I mean, um, reading and writing data on a disk. So this is probably from 1995, and uh, you can see like how minuscule and how small they are. And also metal oxides are also used as uh, for air purifier. Uh, that is like a small uh, 
uh, substrate, uh, I mean, a small uh, coating of metal oxide can be helpful in uh, uh, disassociating water molecules and those water molecules in, uh, then de uh, de deteriorate into hydroxyl group, which attach itself to uh, pollutant and release carbon dioxide or um, uh, carbon dioxide and water molecules. So that is a, a good uh, example as well. And also right now, currently uh, in the International Space Station, we are using solar arrays, uh, which also use metal oxide. So from a basic CD-ROM, which is obsolete now, obviously, but to International Space Station, the, ex I mean, the usage use case scenario of metal oxides are far too many. And for uh, like, if we also continue, I mean, uh, we also use our vehicles to reach to our work or leisure time. And even those, they use oxygen sensors. So if you just take a small uh, example of an IC engine, it requires an air to fuel uh, ratio, um, mixture ratio of 14.7 is to one. That is what for one uh, part of fuel, it requires 14.7 parts of air to uh, have a complete com complete combustion. So even if there is a lean or a rich mixture of with um, higher oxygen content, that will re result in incomplete combustion of fuel. That means uh, the efficiency of the vehicle would be lower and we'll have more maintenance. And again, the effect on uh, atmosphere, the environmental effects are far too grave. And we, as we can see how the uh, climate change has been affecting all of us. So it, just a simple example is a uh, zirconia sensor, which, uh, which uses the exhaust gas as coming out of the car, but it also has a reference air, which then recalibrates and it's, uh, itself. And it gives like a feedback loop to make sure that we are around this ratio to uh, get uh, a perfect combustion. So, I mean, this is, these are just a few examples that I felt like that can be used uh, for our work. And from there, there are like different uh, metal oxide that are used, but for our uh, work, this work, uh, basically we decided to work and focus more on beta form of gallium oxide. So gallium oxide has been uh, kind of uh, uh, gaining attention in the past few years uh, in semiconductor industry uh, because of its exciting properties. And also it uh, has a wide band gap, uh, which is around, I mean, to the tune of 4.8 electron volt and a, a very high uh, uh, dielectric breakdown voltage of around 8 MV. And it is super stable uh, uh, because of its high melting point and out of its multiple polymorphs, that is alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon, beta gallium is one of the most uh, stable forms. And uh, to talk a little bit about its structure, so it uh, the gallium, uh, gallium atoms in this uh, beta gallium oxide, they assume two positions, that is a tetrahedral, uh, uh, in tetrahedral coordination with four oxygen atoms and in uh, octahedral with six oxygen uh, being, uh, atoms being shared in the system. Uh, in the past, uh, there have been a lot of doping, mixing uh, and creation of thin films, uh, which uh, uses different elements like silicon, tin, moly, uh, molybdenum, uh, niobium, zinc, uh, tungsten, titanium, lead, and these, uh, these uh, specific elements give rise to different properties uh, of uh, the final product. Like if we are making thin films uh, with tin, uh, tin, uh, tin as, a, as a mixing agent or a dopant, uh, the electrical resistivity is improved and overall concentration of uh, the charge carrier concentration also improves. So we can basically use a bunch of uh, elements and can tune our properties depending on what is our uh, final goal. And tungsten and titanium has also been studied and it has shown that they have a redshift in optical band gap uh, in thin films. So this is where, where uh, I kind of, I mean, as I, I mean, we kind of decided to work on uh, and understand how tungsten and titanium uh, 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 helps uh, in the evolution of the uh, optical band gap. So uh, this is how the motivation worked because uh, in this paper, this particular paper that we were looking for, uh, the gallium, I mean, the beta gallium oxide was claimed to be doped at around 30% of tungsten, which is a really high percentage of uh, tungsten, uh, tungsten in the system. And that is where we were uh, a little bit, uh, little intrigued by the solubility limit because 30% uh, uh, of gallium being replaced by tungsten was something that we wanted to 
re, uh, reaffirm and reconfirm uh, through our experimental methods. And uh, that is why we chose to work with tungsten in the beginning. And also tungsten has a very uh, uh, close proximity and comparable uh, ionic radius in both tetrahedral and octahedral co uh, coordination with gallium ions. So that is why we chose this system to study and to uh, build up, uh, build upon uh, work from ceramics and then move into tungsten. So this was our basic motivation behind this entire uh, project. So I decided to work in two phases. Uh, the first one was to uh, understand the thin film, uh, uh, sorry, first one was bulk ceramics and uh, in bulk ceramics, how to uh, vary uh, the different concentration of tungsten as a dopant, then understand its uh, solubility limits. And from there, under after understanding solubility limits, go for uh, uh, understanding the morphology, the structural properties and the optical properties. And then once that the, the, uh, the tungsten doping or the tungsten mixing is done, move to titanium for a comparative uh, study. That is what the phase one of this pro I mean, of the study was. And in phase two, we have a very uh, good uh, PLD, pulse laser deposition system uh, at, uh, I mean, at our lab in UTEP. Uh, so we uh, this I mean so the phase two basically in, uh, revolves around taking the best uh, case uh, the best uh, tungsten concentration and then uh, making thin films uh, out of those uh, uh, that concentration and understanding the uh, properties of these thin films and then probably growing epitaxial thin films in the end and uh, get different properties and then we can work on uh, applications probably in the future for device applications. So this was like the phase one and phase two of our projects. So to uh, jump quickly into uh, the actual work. So I would be talking about the bulk ceramics and how we worked on the system. So experimental uh, details are pretty straightforward. So we first take the gallium oxide and uh, measure it with tungsten oxide in stoichiometric proportions and then we, move, uh, we create uh, different sets of samples. So for this uh, tungsten uh, GWO, the, the system will be called as GWO, gallium tungsten oxide from now on. And it was similar to the GTO, that is gallium titanium oxide system as well. The experimental section is uh, almost similar, just uh, there are a few differences in the processing temperature. So uh, then we created uh, different atomic percentage of samples. So X, uh, X equal to 0, 0.00 is pure gallium oxide, then adding five atom percent, then 10, uh, 0 0.5, 0, 0 0.05, 0 0.10, 0 0.15, and up to 0 0.25 atom percent. And after making these samples, we would then pulverize them in, uh, in a motor pestle and to ensure a, a complete ho I mean, homogeneous mixture of these two constituent elements or the precursors. And after that, we go to the first uh, calcination step. So in this project, we also discuss, I mean, uh, went into two-step calcination process, uh, which I would be discussing later in the results section. So first calcination process was done at 1050 degrees Celsius for 12 hours. And after that, we did some XRD of the, uh, the system, understand the properties, how the secondary phase is evolving, and then move into the second calcination process, which was conducted at 1150 degrees Celsius, same for, uh, for 12 hours, and to, again, to re-verify it with the uh, secondary phase formation. Of a, or if we are having a secondary phase or we are getting a, a, a completely uh, solid solution of a completely, a completely dissolved uh, soluble tungsten oxide in the gallium oxide system. After that, we create pellets, which are like tablets basically. So pellet, uh, pellet, uh, pellets were made and PVA was used as a binding agent and which was then uh, finally centered at 1250 degrees Celsius temperature, which was the final processing temperature and the PVA, the binding agent uh, basically evaporates at around uh, 500 degrees, C, uh, degrees Celsius. And once that was done, we, all, we once again went back to the XRD system and, uh, and checked for the uh, phase purity. Like if we are getting, again, how much of a secondary phase we are getting in the system. Once that was done, we went for structural property measurements. Uh, so some XRD analysis, some SEM micrographs, then moving ahead with the optical properties, uh, with UV-vis uh, spectroscopy. And then we went to understand uh, the 
electronic structure using the XPS to understand how the species, like uh, the different uh, contributing species, that is gallium, tungsten, and oxygen, and what valence state are they present in our system. So that was done, and after that, uh, we also tried to measure a little bit of dielectric properties so that we can pr produce, uh, we can you know at least present a case in which these uh, metal oxides or a combination of different metal oxide can be used to uh, serve uh, uh, in wireless communication devices or something on those lines. So this entire work of GW, it produced uh, uh, three manuscript, uh, I mean, three manuscript, which was a really uh, good thing. And to talk about a little bit about re the results. Uh, so the uh, so as I talked about the first calcination step, so the uh, XRD graph here, as you can see at 1050 degrees Celsius, we could all uh, we could already see a secondary phase that is tungsten oxide already present even in the lowest concentration of uh, tungsten oxide in the system. So at even 0 0.005 atom uh, percent, there was a secondary phase, and then it it, it, it I mean exponentially kept, kept on increasing as we moved up higher in the concentration. And as we moved ahead with the second step uh, of the calcination at 1150 degrees Celsius you can see that the, the secondary phase is kind of uh, retreating. That is the solubility is getting better as we move higher in the temperature. And to, uh, to explain why we chose two-step calcination processes, the first step that is at 1050 degrees Celsius, it was done to decompose the precursors and obtain a homogeneous, uh, homogeneously mixed uh, precursor. And the second step was used to get a complete solid state solution and let the solid state uh, reaction basically uh, occur. And also this, uh, the, the second calcination step all allows the structure to stabilize. So that was one of a uh, uh, very good uh, uh, kind of a segue into a uh, different calcination process and having us uh, having a solid state reaction uh, taking place to our benefit. So the, the and the, then this is the final uh, centered uh, XRD patterns. So after uh, reaching at 1250 degrees Celsius and centering for six hours, we could see that the secondary phase is almost not, not almost like it is definitely not present in uh, concentration for X equal to 0 0.05 and 0 0.10, but we could still see at X equal to 0 0.15, 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, we could definitely see tungsten oxide. So this reaffirms our uh, motivation where, uh, where the challenge was to find out is 30% uh, of uh, tungsten oxide uh, soluble in gallium oxide system. Is that high amount of percentage uh, possible to be, you know, po is there possible to dissolve in the tungsten, uh, gallium oxide system? So yes, we have a solubility limit at around 0 0.10 atom percent. And, and uh, yeah, so that, this was a really good uh, realization. So. And also, you, uh, uh, we can see that. Oh, sorry. So we can see that there is like a secondary phase at these concentrations. To to look at that, look at it critically, we can see there is a peak shift at lower concentration. That is that also means that tungsten is getting absorbed in the system. But as we move higher in the concentration, the the peak shift is uh, it's non-existent. That means that the tungsten oxide is segregating. It's it's not dissolving or it's not soluble into the system as uh, anticipated. So these were uh, a few XRD, I mean, these were a few XRD peaks that we uh, decided to work on. And also the, uh, this is just a graphical representation of how the peak shift occurs. So for pure gallium oxide to 0.1, we'll see the peak shift, but then after that, it is almost non-existent. Moving ahead with the uh, some of the uh, grain morphology evolution, to see how the grains are evolving, as we uh, are mixing uh, tungsten oxide in our system, so this is uh, the uh, this is a this is an SEM micrograph of uh, pure gallium oxide, and as you can see, the shape is more or less a rod. I mean, the grains the grain shape is more or less rod shaped, and with a small concentration of tungsten oxide in the system, we can see the, the, that the grains are evolving into spherical shape, and as we move higher up in the concentration. The grain size, grain size becomes bigger, and we get faceted uh, spherical shape with unreacted tungsten oxide segregating towards uh, towards the uh, outside edge of uh, every grain. Uh, so this was yeah. So this this is how the grain morphology evolved. 
And uh, also, we could also find that there is a, a good amount of unreacted tungsten oxide present in the system. So, and this so this is like pure gallium oxide, and this is a so complete solid solution of uh, pure gallium oxide and tungsten oxide at lower concentration. And we use this formula to calculate the unreacted tungsten oxide in our system using the in highest intensity peaks of tungsten oxide and gallium oxide to get. 2%, 8%, 9% approximately um, undissolved, unreacted uh, tungsten oxide in our um, system. And uh, we also were able to observe a couple of uh, twin lamellar, I mean, uh, in most of the samples and most of the concentrations, we could also observe twin lamellar structure, which gives rise to, uh, sorry, which gives uh, a higher surface area on the grains, uh, grains uh, of, uh, Concent I mean, on the grains of uh, uh, samples with higher tungsten concentrations. So this part is going. This part is going to be very useful in uh, the under understanding the dielectric properties because uh, the increased surface area presents some interesting uh, properties. We'll talk about it late in the later sections. Uh, Professor Bronson was kind enough to help us uh, understand how the uh, possible oxides of tungsten are evolving in our. Uh, GWO system. So this this work was also presented. I mean, this work was good. Uh, I mean, this was uh, included in one of the manuscripts, and uh, it helped us uh, work around with uh, tungsten oxide evolution. Uh, basically, understanding WO3 concentrations uh, in our system. Moving ahead, uh, so uh, getting the optical properties of these samples as a, uh, I mean, so we did some UV spectroscopy for all the samples. And as you can see, with the addition of uh, tungsten oxide in the system, there is uh, definitely a rise, I mean, the absorbance definitely increases as we move uh, ahead in the concentration, uh, concentration. And it moves uh, the, uh, the absorption spectra moves towards the visible region, basically. And uh, to uh, calculate uh, the band gaps of these samples uh, from, uh, I mean, uh, to calculate the band gaps, we use the tau method, which is uh, pretty uh, straightforward and given by this formula. And uh, we could calculate uh, a direct and indirect band gap from uh, from uh, our samples and from the data that was observed, the, uh, the absorbance spectra that was obtained from our uh, samples. So the uh, the direct band gap was uh, uh, in the range. Okay, so uh, let me backtrack a little. So the theoretical band gap is calculated around at 4.88 electron volts, and the indirect band gap for single crystal uh, gallium oxide is calculated at around 4.84 uh, 4 electron volts. So the difference between these two band gaps is around 0 0.04, and also the experimental the, uh, uh, the the experimental difference is around 0 0.05 electron volts, which is for more or less for thin films. But this study, which involves the use of uh, ceramic materials, I mean, uh, bulk ceramic materials, we found that the, uh, the indirect band gap was a little lower than anticipated. And the difference, between, uh, the difference between the direct and the indirect band gap was around 0.33 electron volts. And this, uh, the, lower, uh, the lower band indirect band gap was also uh, attributed to the lattice strain that, uh, that could have been caused because of the high temperature processing process around 1250 degrees Celsius. And also, uh, we, I mean, we cannot compare indefinitely with the thin film performance of bulk ceramics. So there are more point defects in bulk ceramics than there are in single crystal. So this was used to calculate the band gaps. And to um, summarize this part of the work that was done, we can see that, I mean, uh, so uh, we have pure gallium oxide or the intrinsic gallium oxide with a certain amount of band gap that is around 4.6 electron volts. And as we, as we increase the tungsten concentration in the system, we could find uh, that uh, there is a solid solution formed at around uh, lower concentrations of the tungsten oxide in our system. But as we move further higher with the, con uh, with the tungsten concentration, we definitely see uh, tungsten oxide presenting itself as a secondary phase, and it it uh, secondary phase, and it gets um, it gets segregated, and this results in the drop in the band gap uh, with higher concentration of uh, tungsten oxide uh, tungsten in the system. So basically, this was the the first part, and we could understand how things are uh, evolving in our system. 
So moving ahead, uh, since we have three different uh, uh, contributing elements in our system, that is gallium tungsten and oxygen, a, uh, the XPS is, uh, is an interesting technique to understand how the valence states of, uh, of the contributing species is, uh, is evolving. So this is an XPS spectra, survey spectra of GWO compounds. And as you can see, we, we could clearly see G, uh, GA2P peaks, O1, uh, O1S and W4F peaks in our system. Uh, there was a previous PhD student, uh, Dr. Roy, currently uh, working, uh, uh, I mean, currently he is working somewhere in Florida. So he was uh, really helpful in getting these XPS spectras from PNNL. And we could uh, find the contribution of different species in our system, in our system. So to, uh, uh, to just go for with each element in our system. So this is the GA2P core level spectra. And uh, there are two uh, specific distinct peaks of this uh, deconvoluted peaks of uh, gallium that is at uh, GA2P3 by two and GA2P1 by two. And now the, uh, these uh, components are uh, around uh, based around at 117.5 electron volts and 1144.2 electron volt. And for the GA two P three by two, that uh, from the literature, uh, the metallic GA peak is around one 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 six point seven electron volts, and which is almost uh, close to uh, within one electron volt uh, range of uh, the experimental values. So that means that GA is present in its highest valence state, that is a plus three state, in all the mm, all the. Uh, GWO samples, basically from pure gallium oxide to the highest concentration of uh, G, I mean, GWO samples. So uh, to understand, yeah, so this one uh, is, this is a uh, core, I mean, core level spectra for tungsten for uh, W4F uh, uh, core level. And here we could see uh, in, in an interesting um, observation that is uh, at this peak, that is around, uh, 37, uh, sorry, 35.4, uh, we have tungsten present uh, in WO3 state. That is, we have W6 uh, plus, I, I mean, the valence state of tungsten is W6 plus. But we could also see a smaller, uh, smaller hump here, which was uh, corresponding to WO2. And this uh, WO2 with W4 plus valence state was observed for lower concentrations up to around 0.15, and after that it 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 went away. So this uh, that 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 means that the lower valence state of uh, sorry. So that means the lower valence state of tungsten uh, exists only at uh, lower concentration of the GWO compounds. And as we move in, the, con the concentration goes higher, the WO2 gets, I mean, the WO2 uh, disappears fully and what we are getting is WO3. So that further uh, corroborates with our findings from the XRD that we are getting a segregated phase of WO3 in our GWO samples. And the oxygen uh, uh, core level spectra was uh, pretty straightforward and uh, it, the uh, binding energies uh, indicate that this is a bit, I mean, the, the peaks are corresponding to GA, GAO or WO, WO uh, in nature. So basically what we understood from this is uh, the, w, uh, the tungsten content is, uh, in single phase GWO com compound is basically coming out of uh, a mixture, uh, mixture of GWO, uh, sorry, mixture of gallium oxide and tungsten oxide. Uh, at lower values, but as we move higher into the, into the tungsten concentration, it is present in a composite form. And tungsten uh, exhibits a mixed valence state that is at uh, lower uh, lower values of uh, uh, tungsten concentration, it is present in W4 plus and W4 or W6 plus uh, uh, valence state. But as we move ahead, it is all W6 plus. And gallium, again, is present in its highest valence state at its plus three. So this this kind of this understanding uh, is again important because we can also talk about it in uh, the next section that is the dielectric properties of the system. So coming to the next part, the dielectric properties. So I decided to work uh, and understand a little bit more about the dielectric properties of these ceramics because I I mean. Uh, uh, a lot of wireless devices also use lithium and uh, I mean uh, they use. 
uh, metal oxide, which also contained uh, uh, dangerous uh, or volatile material like lithium and sodium. So to eliminate those uh, uh, and have more stable uh, gallium oxide or a mixture of uh, metal oxides or gallium oxide, we can we can use these. So basically, we that was the more more or less the idea behind uh, understanding the dielectric properties. So uh, the experimental details are pretty straightforward. So uh, this was a device that we created in our lab, which would make a circuit. So we'll take the pellet and sandwich it between these two plates and which would then be connected to a circuit uh, circuit that was built in a house by a wonderful REU uh, undergraduate student from UC Santa Barbara that came to uh, intern at our lab uh, at UTEP. And then this device would be con connected to the LCR meter. And, uh, and again, the readings would be available when this uh, entire assembly, uh, sorry, this entire assembly would go inside this tubular furnace and we'll seal this furnace and then heated from uh, room temperature to 500 degrees Celsius and from one kilohertz to one megahertz frequency range and uh, obtain the various um, dielectric properties at tan delta value, also the AC conductivity of, uh, of our GWO pellets. So uh, this slide basically shows the change in dielectric, uh, dielectric constant uh, with the change in frequency as a function uh, at different temperatures. So the dielectric uh, constant basic uh, more or less depends on the grain morphology and the microstructure. And as you may remember from the SEM micrographs, we had rod shaped structure, which then uh, with the increase in tungsten concentration, it evolves into spherical shape and henceforth. So this is a quite important because uh, at uh, as the grain morphology improves, uh, the ionic space charge and uh, grain boundary polarization are dominant at lower levels of frequency, and hence you can see here that the dielectric uh, the the dielectric constant has assumes higher values for all the uh, uh, GW I mean uh, gallium oxide I mean sorry CW compounds. So it assumes a high value. And also the increase in space charge polarization at grain boundaries uh, creates. Uh, a potential barrier. That is, there are uh, charges present at the grain boundaries, which are creating a barrier for a uh, conduction, and hence, uh, again, further higher uh, dielectric constant. And as we move higher up in the frequency, the um, the dielectric constant dies down because the uh, uh, because the polarizing phenomena lags behind the uh, applied voltage. So to uh, have a semblance from experimental and theoretical uh, perspective. We used a uh, DBI model uh, to understand this dispersion behavior. And this was done because GWO consists of uh, different species. That is uh, gallium in three, uh, three plus state, oxygen in two minus W six plus and W four, four plus, as uh, we saw in the XPS section that we have a mixed valence state of uh, of tungsten present in our system. So the DBI model, which is given by this equation was employed for understanding uh, for our understanding from theoretical perspective. And in this equation, you can see there are two unknowns. Uh, I mean, these values are straightforward. I mean, they, they can be uh, obtained from the uh, data that we get from the uh, LCR meter, but the tau, which is the uh, relaxation time and alpha, which is the spreading factor is uh, we are not, uh, uh, we don't get those values from our uh, experiment. Excuse me. So to get those, we then, use cold cold plots and found out these alpha and tau values and then these alpha and tau values were then again plugged back into the equation uh, the, into the d by model and we obtained the ther theoretical values for our uh, uh, system for uh, different pro uh, dielectric uh, constant for different samples and as you can see that it is uh, more or less in good agreement with the experimental uh, experimental uh, values Moving ahead, uh, we also could uh, get the uh, effect of temperature on dielectric constant as a function of frequency, that is from one kilohertz to one megahertz. As you can see for pure gallium oxide, uh, at, uh, up for pure gallium oxide, at these, uh, at temperature around 350 to four, uh, 420 degrees Celsius, we could see a, a high intensity relaxation peak, uh, peak and as the concentration uh, increases, 
that is from 0.05 to 0.1, the, that peak uh, reduces uh, in its intensity and it's more or less non-existent, more or less non-existent. And this is because of the W6 plus ions present in our system. And also uh, since uh, the unit cell volume decreases or it shrinks due to gallium substitution by W6 uh, plus ions, and this actually improves the uh, charge carrying capability or the uh, uh, yeah charge carrying capability of our system and this dielectric relaxation reappears uh, reappears or resurfaces as the concentration further increases and this is attri attributed basically to the undissolved tungsten oxide in our system at the grain boundaries uh, to uh, and a little bit uh, to understand the dielectric loss uh, uh, loss as a function of uh, tungsten concentration tungsten concentration in our system. So uh, uh, here we can see that the behavior of the dielectric loss uh, loss mostly uh, the tan D values are lower at for lower uh, lower frequency. I mean, sorry, they are uh, lower at lower uh, frequency uh, frequency level, and then. As we increase the temperature, the, the, the tan D values uh, exponentially rises. And uh, the yeah, the increase uh, and as a function of, of frequency here, frequency here, the increase in tungsten ion concentration in GW system also uh, results in, in in the increase in in the tan D values. So as you can see. Uh, for x equal to 0 0.00, uh, we have a lower level, uh, lower values, most, more or less it has a lower value of uh, tan D. And as we increase uh, the concentration of tungsten, the tan D values, uh, tangent delta values increases for all the concentrations. This is also because of the multiple species of ions or mixed valence states of tungsten ions present in our system, and also the charge imbalance which, create, uh, which, uh, which results in the substitution of gallium ions in our system. Finally, to look at the uh, AC conductivity of our samples, uh, these samples, it is a, like uh, kind of obvious that with the increase in the tungsten concentration at x equal to 0 0.2. So these samples were uh, just, we just read four samples from this system. So for 0 0.20 concentration, the AC conductivity was the best, uh, the best. And this again, rolls back to the uh, volumes, uh, the, uh, decrease, uh, decrease or the shrinkage of volume uh, of the unit cell of uh, GWO system and hence uh, the better uh, electron hopping between cations and hence the improved AC conductivity. To summarize this section, uh, this section, uh, so we hypothesize that uh, a heterogeneous uh, system uh, in which there are uh, gallium oxide is present in the forms of grains, which is separated by the segregated or the nucleated uh, tungsten oxide as composite, which is which then finally segregates towards the grain boundaries, and creating uh, giving rise to higher dielectric constant values, and this also again basically explains how the AC conductivity also increases uh, as we go higher up in the concentration of tungsten in our system. So. Uh, this brings to the uh, th this brings me to the final section. After understanding the GWO system, we went to the GTO system. So GTO system is uh, I did some uh, changes uh, in terms of uh, the concentration, the final concentration that we are going to use, taking titanium, the temperatures that we are going to use uh, uh, for this GTO system from the learnings that were obtained from our GWO system. So for this. Uh, since we understood that the, uh, the uh, solubility will be restricted, we did not go for higher concentrations of, G, uh, of, uh, of titanium mixing, but we just uh, truncated it at a 0 0.20. We uh, improved the um, processing temperatures to 1150 degrees Celsius as the first calcination temperature, then 1250 degrees Celsius as second calcination temperature, and finally centering at 1350 degrees Celsius. So uh, more or less the experimental date section was kind of similar. And this was just, again, I want to reiterate that this was done to understand and com understand, compare and contrast the properties uh, that were obtained from GWO and, uh, and uh, juxtapose it with GTO system. So directly moving into our uh, results section. So this was the first calcination, uh, first calcination uh, temperature or the first processing temperature. And uh, yeah, also a small point here that the uh, 
titanium oxide is present in uh, two uh, two phases. That is uh, anatase and rutile as a mixture in one precursor. So we uh, found that, but when we uh, mix these samples and when we went for calcination temperature, the anatase phase was totally missing from our uh, XRDs. So that that uh, that gave uh, that gave me uh, a reason to search. So when I did some literature review, it it seems that anatase uh, phase gets converted into a more uh, stable phase that is rutile phase at as the temperature moves uh, higher and around at 1000 degrees Celsius, the anatase phase completely converts itself into a, a stable rutile phase. So that was uh, that was a good finding, but we need to, uh, I mean, we need to understand that even at uh, 1150 degrees Celsius as compared to 1050, the first calcination temperature for GWO, we could see a rutile phase uh, present or the secondary phase present even at the lowest concentration. So this, this this means that we will have to increase the temperature and hence the second uh, step of calcination. Uh, before that, uh, uh, I just want to yeah, uh, suggest, not suggest that, uh, I mean, I just want to present that we also calculated the volume fraction of anatase and the rutile phase present in the system using the XRDs, XRD. And uh, it, it came out to be that 80% was anatase phase and 20% was the rutile phase. So uh, coming back to the XRDs and at second calcination temperature at 1250 degrees Celsius, we could see that the rutile phase is converted, uh, sorry, the secondary phase free solution is obtained. That is 0.05 uh, atom percent is completely getting absorbed into the gallium oxide system. And that, that I mean, the higher temperature but lower solubility also is probably, uh, I mean, uh, a, a factor because of the allovalent nature or the uh, of the valent states of titanium and gallium. So, uh, so again, this is just a graphical representation of the undissolved uh, TiO2 present uh, phase uh, present in our system. So, we have pure gallium oxide. We have a 0.05 atom percent, which creates a solid solution, and then we have some undissolved TiO2 in the system. And these are the percentages of undissolved or insoluble titanium oxide in our system. And that takes us back to the high, uh, highest processing temperature in this, country, in this case, that is at 1350 degrees Celsius, we could again see no uh, uh, secondary phase present at X equal to 0 0.05, uh, but there was, again, there was secondary phase present at 0 0.10 uh, concentration and henceforth. Uh, we also kind of found an interesting peak uh, in uh, in these XRDs. That is um, that is around twenty eight point five uh, something around that area, uh, that uh, degree, uh, two theta degrees, and that was actually when we uh, uh, mastered that peak with the literature. It was coming because of uh, the rutile phase of uh, of titanium oxide getting converted into a metastable uh, monoclinic structure, uh, monoclinic TiO two. So as we increase the temperature, probably the rutile phase gets converted into a monoclinic phase is what the conclusion came out to be. And again, as we can see, the uh, volume fraction of uh, secondary phase that is titanium oxide reduced. That, this is just for the rutile phase. And it, uh, it reduced a little bit as, uh, as previously reported. It was around 15%, 13.9 uh, uh, atomic percent uh, per, uh, insolubility, sorry. 13.9% insolubility at the highest concentration of TiO2, but it reduced uh, to 6.4 because of the conversion of uh, rutile phase into monoclinic phase. Moving ahead, one sec. These are representative uh, ACM micrographs of our system. And as you can see, I mean, as anticipated, there will be a change in the microstructure because of um, because of uh, grain morphology, because of the inclusion of titanium in our system. So these were uh, quite interesting SEM micrographs. And as you can see, we could again see twin structures present in the grain, on, I mean, on the grains. And also we could also see that the TiO2 uh, remains as um, a columnar structure or just um, uh, undissolved TiO2 was again observed at higher concentrations as anticipated. These are just representative micrograph. I didn't include all of them. Yeah. So, and 
uh, again, we went back to the XPS uh, again, thanks to Dr. Roy, and to understand what kind of um, uh, valence states of gallium, oxygen, and uh, titanium are present in our system. So this is the core level XPS spectra for the GTO compounds uh, at highest processing temperature, and we could see uh, the constituent elements uh, present in our system. And uh, uh, to go back to the uh, valence states, so G8, 3P, uh, 2P, 3 by 2 peak, again, falls around 11, uh, 16.4 uh, 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 EV of binding energy. And this represents, uh, there is no uh, appreciable change in any of the uh, system that we examined. And hence it is more or less, it, it confirms that GA is present in, present in its three plus state. And similar to similar things for oxygen, uh, it is present at 530 point, uh, for 530.5 uh, electron volt, which again represents that uh, GA is binding with oxygen or at, uh, with titanium and oxygen. And the, yes, for uh, TI uh, two P peaks, uh, we could see two uh, peaks. One was a pretty sharp peak at, 580, uh, sorry, 485.5 electron volt, and the other one was at 464, uh, 464.2 electron volt. That was TI two peak, uh, one by two peak. This 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 represents the TI four plus state. And uh, after, uh, I mean, we tried to fix, uh, fit this uh, peak in in these compounds uh, in these um, uh, graphs, but this was not a good fit. That means that uh, this peak was a short-lived uh, peak in comparison to the three, uh, three, uh, sorry, three P, uh, P three, uh, sorry, TI two P three by two peak, and hence uh, TI is present in its uh, highest valence state. Uh, it can be, it can be claimed that TI is, uh, is present in its highest tetravalent state, or it stabilizes in its highest valence state. Uh, we did, did some UV spectroscopy and um, TI, uh, TiO2 is uh, supposed to give two absorption edges, uh, two absorption edges, and, and and it could be seen from the uh, optical absorption spectra uh, with the one. I mean, the absorption edge one is around 290 or, or 300 nanometers, and the second one is around uh, 400 nanometer, which is a little uh, weaker uh, absorption edge. And this also this this also comes because of the undissolved TiO2 in our system. We went back to the tau plots to understand how the um, band gap are evolving because of the inclusion of TiO2 in our system. So the direct band gap basically shows that uh, uh, the for pure gallium oxide it came at 4.6 electron volts and the highest uh, dissolved uh, the highest concentration was at 4.2 electron volt. But the second absorption edge is a, a weak absorption edge, and that is also attributed to the inhomogeneity of the mixing and phase separation occurring in our um, phase separation occurring in our uh, GTO system. When we did plot uh, the, the indirect band gap, there was a negligible uh, uh, band gap. Uh, there was a negligible uh, absorption edge. Uh, absorption edge. And there was a second absorption edge, which was a really strong absorption edge. And this basically contribu is contributed uh, because of the undissolved TiO2 in our, uh, in our system. And it is approximately 2.8 electron volt as compared to, uh, uh, as compared to 3.0 electron volts for TiO2. And this again is, uh, is we attributed it to the higher temperature processing conditions. And that led to, uh, I mean, which le led to, uh, lattice strains and defects in our GTO system. So to finally conclude, uh, we did a systematic uh, study of uh, solubility uh, of tungsten doped gallium oxide compounds and understood the evolution of property with the concentration and uh, with temperature. The solubility limits was also uh, uh, found out and it was very important because uh, that way we can understand like uh, for any other application, how much of tungsten or any dopant can be involved in a system rather than going for an arbitrary number. And we also saw a redshift in the band gap for all GWO compounds. Similar to the uh, similar to GWO, we also did some TI uh, titanium doping into our system. 
system to understand, compare, and contrast the understanding from GWO system with GTO system. And again, the GTO system corroborated our finding from GWO system. That is, uh, we cannot go for any arbitrary amount of uh, TI in our system. And the solubility limits were found at less than 0 0.10 atom percent. And TiO2 also converts itself into a monoclinic phase at very high temperatures. And there were two absorption edges found in GTO system as compared to one absorption edge in GWO system. And uh, also the inclusion of uh, TI transition. So in, 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 in its entirety, the inclusion of transition metal in gallium oxide uh, reveals a quite interesting properties uh, from optical standpoint and also from electronic structure. So these uh, samples, Mm, uh, can this study can be used uh, to um, fabricate thin films and from there we can move to device fabrication which can be used at elevated temperature because uh, because as you can see the processing temperatures were really high and we can basically have devices which can operate at really high temperature so these were the uh, findings from this i mean the, the work and the future uh, work that we are currently undertaking uh, is doping with uh, working with tin, uh, tin, because tin produces a quite a, a quite an interesting set of uh, properties due to its higher uh, uh, like it, it it improves the electronic uh, charge I mean charge carrier concentration so it can be basically uh, a very useful uh, uh, system that can work for uh, devices that can be used in electronic applications. Also, uh, I have been working uh, previously on gallium oxide thin films, as, as I mentioned in my previous uh, slides, as phase two, that is the thin film deposition. So I already finished that part uh, and also published a couple of uh, papers from pure gallium thin uh, films uh, and GWO thin films, um, one directly and one with uh, one working with one of our other teammates. And uh, yeah, I did not include the, those uh, that work in our presentation in this presentation because it would have become a really more lengthy presentation. So that's why I did not include. But I just wanted to show that uh, these papers were accepted, like uh, not accepted. These were published like uh, two weeks ago, or two or three weeks ago, uh, recently. So one went to the Nano Express. That, that was where I I studied the uh, structural and mechanical properties of uh, gallium oxide thin films and also one of the paper in which I worked uh, with uh, other uh, PhD student in our lab. We also uh, tried to understand the green photoluminescence uh, of pure gallium oxide thin films. So that's about it. And I sincerely thank Dr. Ram uh, Professor Ramana for his continued guidance and support uh, throughout my PhD uh, journey because it, it would have not been possible because without his support and encouragement. Uh, I mean, I really appreciate it. And I really want to thank uh, all the committee members for taking out uh, time to uh, uh, come to this presentation as well as uh, agreeing to be on my committee. And a special uh, shout out to Dr. Bundy, Dr. Bhattu and Dr. Roy who helped me uh, during my PhD. And thank you so much. If you have questions, let me know. Thank you, Vishal, thank you. And sorry, like we forced you because of so many meetings going on, et cetera. We forced you to, to cut it down to an hour. I know you could easily go almost three hours with your all. <laughs> Okay. So it was my mistake. And then Dr. Lau is also busy with other meeting. And as I mentioned at the beginning, like so many meetings going on. Anyway, uh, it is the time for audience to ask any questions to Mr. Vishal. And then uh, committee will spend some time. That's how it works. Audience, any questions? Yeah. I just have a comment that this was ex this is excellent work. Um, so in the future work, you talked about using tin. What are your expectations with the tin? And one more question where you showed in the beginning, um, this being a sensor in automobiles. So just those two quick questions. Okay. So uh, tin has different valence states for, I mean, uh, tin, uh, has different valence states. So I, what I am expecting from tin to come out is like uh, provide uh, 
pure gallium oxide at uh, uh, as an intrinsic uh, gallium oxide, it will have different band gap. But when we include a little bit of, of tin, it will give rise to charge carrier concentration. So that can actually uh, be used as uh, probably an optoelectronic device or something that can replace, I don't know, I'm not sure, but yeah, it can mm -hmm. be used as a rectifier or uh, MOSFET or in that direction. So I, okay. I mean, that's what my expectation is. Okay, and one more question in the very beginning. You showed this as a sensor and look like um, vehicles. What yes. are the applications at the start of your talk? So, so I was just, this was, this was just- Yeah, right uh, there. Uh -huh. Yes, this is a zirconia sensor that, is, that we basically use and uh, that has been used in the industry as a oxygen sensor. So this was just an example of metal oxide for, and not for beta gallium oxide. So oh, it, okay. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It's okay. just an example and continuation from this slide, it's basically. Okay. Yeah. But do you plan on doing that or trying uh, the One, beta gallium oxide out? Yes. Place it at zirconium for oxygen sensor. Uh, I personally haven't been able to work on this, but one of our P, uh, PhD, previous PhD, uh, PhD uh, student, uh, he worked with uh, uh, one of the system in which they actually devised thin films that were also used for uh, doing oxygen sensing. And uh, okay. I, I think you were in his dissertation committee as well, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sandeep. I, I was going to mention that like yeah. Dr. Hodges was there uh, yeah. in that committee too. Yeah. Okay. Very that that has been, but like going like a full sensor, uh, we haven't done it yet. Okay. All right. But Thank properties you. have work. been, yes, have been uh, shown. Yes. Okay. Great work. Thank you. Thank Were you. Were you at Rice? Did I we am, go to Rice together? Yes, we went to Rice. Conference? Okay. Yes, we did. Yeah. And I'm going to join Rice as a postdoc uh, oh. if I pass today. <laughs> so, yeah. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, he's going to go to uh, mechanical engineering department of Rice University oh, uh, to right. do his postdoctoral fellowship. And right. they, he already got the offer, like it's kind of open offer. They told him like anytime from March to June. So hopefully he can. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank At this you. point, the audience, can you all log off, please? All audience. And we shall, in the meantime, try to transfer the post uh, status for me, please. Uh, yes. And then uh, we, we, you're going to spend time with the committee now. Yes. Yeah, hopefully now that's it, right? Nobody else. So this is all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Uh, whoever has questions, Dr. Bronson, Dr. Lau, and Dr. Hodges, keep going. So I have made your host now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you need to stay until uh, uh, committee asks you questions and all. Sure. Sorry, Michelle, like I know, like I was rushing you, but what can we do? No, so that's fine. We are supposed to join the research continuity meeting now. Oh. I'm taking liberty, just like extend the O for, for a few more minutes and see sure. how things will go and then, and then we'll join there. Yes, sir. Dr. Lau, do you have any questions, Dr. Lau, for Vishal? Um, Dr. Ramana, maybe I just have a couple of comments uh, to make. Sure, sure, I, sure, sure, sure. I, I would just like to say that I think that uh, Vishal's work has been excellent. Uh, I think it's really, uh, in fact, even unheard of to have these type of publications and um, you know background awards and even an uh, uh, offer in hand. So I would I would say that uh, you know I don't have any questions on the technical work, but I would just say. As an observation and comment, I think it's been an uh, excellent job with uh, a lot of hard work uh, by Vishal and I obviously a lot of uh, reflection from his uh, advisor as well, I think, and on his work. No. So, uh, no, thank you, thank you. He's done, know, the uh, He's done the work. He's done the work. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Professor Bronson, please. I just have a few. I guess I'm curious on your gallium oxide work. Yes. What is the governing point defects? Point defects? Yes, or the so, defect structure. Uh, these are more or less because uh, uh, 
arising because of the oxygen vacancies that are also created uh, during uh, the, um, how do I say, the processing of uh, precursors. So that is when the oxygen vacancies mostly come into picture and that creates uh, defects, which uh, gives rise to uh, different types of uh, conductivity or, uh, uh, I mean, different types of, uh, how do I say, uh, I'm blanking. I mean, more or less, it's coming out of oxygen uh, vacancies. The okay. difference, yeah. So when you add the tungsten or the, the tungsten, it changes the relative charge of the gallium to a plus three or a plus one, right? Right. So is that what's going on? Is that the governing... Uh, anions is the oxygen vacancy? Yes, that is more or less in that realm. Yeah. Is it the gallium, gallium vacancies? That's why I'm asking what, what is the governing defect structure? Is it oxygen vacancies with gallium interstitials or gallium vacancies with oxygen vacancies or is it uh, gallium interstitials with oxygen vacancy. So which one is it? Which pair is it? Gallium uh, uh, interstitials with oxygen vacancies. Okay. All right. Well, because I'm not sure which one is operating. I'm also curious about your circuit, your equivalent circuit. Your equivalent circuit shows I think it was, um, what is that, a capacitor with a resistor connected in series, right? Yes. So That's which right. one is the green boundary and which one is the resistor? Okay, so, uh, so uh, this is the grains of gallium oxide and this is where the tungsten oxide is segregating and it's creating the resistance. Okay. Yeah. But in your you explain that figure a little more, uh, Vishal, so that uh, Dr. Bronson can get the feel for it. Well, we have pain and we have everything there, seems like. Because in your dissertation, you show a parallel, I mean, a capacitor with a resistor, and then a, another capacitor with a resistor. I think there were six or maybe four. And I'm, I'm curious which one is governing the grain boundary and which one is governing the grain. In your equivalent circuit, or do I have things wrong? I no, I think you have the things right. Uh, so ga gallium oxide is present; it, uh, it presents itself in as uh, grains, as you can see in the circuit, and uh, the uh, the mixture of gallium tungsten oxide (GWO), uh, which forms at lower concentrations, but beyond which, uh, beyond uh, 0.1 concentration, at higher concentration, the tungsten oxide segregates itself around these uh, pure gallium oxide grains and the GWO grains, basically the one that are at already uh, absorbed in the gallium oxide. So that is uh, that that is what this uh, this G I mean pure gallium oxide and GWO uh, structure is. So that is creating the resistance as well. Okay. So so why do you think the other researcher that got thirty weight percent tungsten oxide was so mm -hmm. low. Uh, I mean, uh, they, they also did uh, it, like they hypothesize everything on uh, 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 heterogeneous uh, structure. And I'm not too very sure about like why that would be like a divide, I mean, uh, okay. So we also went for very basic fundamental understanding. So their work were, was more or less uh, uh, more or less uh, on making thin films and uh, just studying the properties. So they did not uh, do any uh, deliberation on what is the possible uh, outcome of this amount of uh, uh, tungsten oxide. So they used five, uh, sorry, they used three concentration. One was at 5%, one was 12.9, and the other one was at 30% uh, concentration of tungsten oxide in gallium oxide system. But uh, the, I mean, that is why like it was like very random for us. So that is why we could not understand that is it possible 30 well, percent and they did not do it 
because your your analysis shows that it's more of a mixed oxide mm -hmm. and a dissolved yes. tungsten and gallium oxide. Yes, uh, which which is quite a big disparity, I would say. Right. But anyway, uh, okay. Well, very good work. Thank you. Thank I'm you, sir. Better stop now. I mean, I could ask more. More just to learn more material, but I think I'll talk to you offline. Uh, so absolutely, sir. And now I will respond to you on your UTEP email ID rather than the minors one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that's a great point, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bronson was asking. So, like, you know, the whole point was we started arguing that, like, you know, how come the gallium oxide can accept 30% of WO3 into the system or 30% uh, of tungsten into the system by substituting simply at gallium place, which is impossible, even from uh, simple uh, material science. So, uh, of course, like, you know, you, you can entertain that uh, discussion very well, I'm sure. It, yeah, one was the calibration was not there, and then the chemical analysis was not there at all. Whatever they put in, they assumed that like it was going there. It was not uh, uh, a systematic study. That's why we thought like we would uh, do a systematic study and find out what exactly is the solubility and so forth. And moreover, another thing is Chris Vandeval. You forgot about it. Uh, I'm, I'm just giving a feedback. This is a healthy discussion. So Chris Vandeval. Do you remember Chris Vandeval's uh, theoretical paper from uh, University of California, Santa Barbara? It's me, yes. Yeah. So what did they say? They also said that if it is tungsten or niobium, they have certain limit on the solubility into gallium oxide. And, and our work actually agrees very well with those calculations, but not the other paper. So then we thought like, you know, the other, other paper was just... Uh, uh, just throwing some numbers, but not systematically studying the, the things. And from committee point of view, if I have to ask you a question, I want to ask you, where is Sanjay coming? You acknowledged everyone, but Sanjay is the one who made all questions. Uh, I, I, I totally, I mean, yes, I <laughs> totally, it just totally blanked out, out of my That's head. okay. This, That's this okay. one, yes, yes. That's okay. Sanjay made it possible. Dr. Bronson's postdoc, Sanjay, was the one who made those calculations. Okay. Yes. yes, that's true. Yeah, he was the one who made all those calculations. And uh, anyway, so go ahead and answer any other questions. Like I've, I've been uh, drilling. Anyway. If no other questions, I know that there is another president meeting is also there with uh, all faculty and all. Am I going to put you in the in the waiting room? You can put me in the waiting room, or I can just stand out of the. <laughs> the I'll put I mean, you in the in the waiting room. Okay.